Welcome to September's Tech of the Month, where we discuss all the latest news and reviews in partnership with Garmin. This month, we'll be looking at the unreleased Pinarello Dan Bingham Road to an incredible hour record victory. We've also got the details of Trek's recent recall to share with you, and we'll be looking at some of the most popular bikes out there and asking, why do they all look the same? We've got the Garmin giveaway, so stick around for that one. But first up, let's have a look at that Pinarello. So as we now know, Dan Bingham broke the hour record and set an incredible distance of 55.548 kilometers. My first question to you, Stefan, is did you think he was going to do it? Uh, well, I have to say that um, I was quietly hopeful uh, myself. Well, he said that he's only needed to get um, seven more watts to um, break the record. It's about less than 1% is like the margin that he needed to achieve uh, that line. And with the support that he yeah, got this time around um, from Ineos, uh, yeah, the, the team that is all about finding that 1%, felt like the stars were going to align and they ended up um, doing so, which uh, maybe isn't quite such a sort of roller coaster of a journey, um, but yeah, very, very glad to see what he managed there. So where do you think he found that 1%? I think most of it um, probably came from the training and being able to concentrate and really sort of put himself sort of like fully physically into training uh, for that event. There's also going to be um, some of the aerodynamics as well. His kit has changed a little bit since his previous attempts. So there's uh, responses from Ineos to consider, but uh, I think that um, it's yeah, mainly going to be the training that edged him across um, the line to uh, break the record. But I think that the interesting uh, point is, is actually looking at the watts and the power that he put out and sort of the physiological and the actual uh, human element um, of the attempt. I say only, but um, he only put out between uh, 350 and uh, 360 watts. And when we compare that to uh, what Bradley Wiggins um, is said to have done for his own uh, hour record, that was between uh, 420 and 450 watts. And so it's a considerable difference between them, isn't it? And it makes you really realize how important the aerodynamics were, which is clearly where Diane Bingham found all of his gains. Ah, exactly. I mean, um, looking at it again, um, uh, Eddie Merckx, there's been some analysis on uh, the power that he might have put out. The estimates put that as in the same range, you know, above 400, maybe going up to um, 450. And so, yeah, yeah, these two titans, sort of Eddie Merckx and Bradley Wiggins, I mean, uh, physiologically, they are on another level. But it's that confluence, I think, um, yes. between uh, the physiological and also the science that goes into it that I think is uh, really quite interesting. And what Dan Bingham has like, both, uh, on both sides in spades. So being as how the gear was so important on Dan Bingham, Bingham's attempt. Can you run us through what he actually used? Um, well, maybe starting with the gears. So he's using a uh, 64 tooth chainring on the front and a 14 tooth sprocket on the back and a 64 tooth chainring. Pretty massive for the tyres. He was running the uh, Continental GP uh, 5000 TT. Uh, interesting that these are tubeless tyres. I'm not sure exactly whether he was um, using a tubeless setup or latex inner tubes um, for the attempt. But um, yeah, notable that these are tubeless yeah. tyres that he was using uh, for the attempt. And yeah, obviously we've got uh, the Pinarello frame set. And um, yeah, I think uh, as yet, um, only released, but there's um, quite a lot of elements um, within the frame set that uh, you can see being carried over from the um, update of the um, Belido uh, TT bike that we saw earlier this year. So that was yeah, quite interesting to see. Uh, then we have Bioracer for the um, kit, so his um, skin suit and the overshoes are all coming from Bioracer and uh, using uh, Mokoff uh, for the uh, coating of the chain. Uh, yeah, all important to have yeah, your chain freshly waxed for uh, these uh, attempts. And for the wheels, he was uh, running the Princeton Track Special wheel set and um, notably running a full section front and rear. Yeah. And so yeah, extreme aerodynamics there. Of course. And I mean, a lot of these uh, suppliers here, they're all sponsors of Ineos. So really, he was able to get hold of the best kit available, which clearly helped. Considering the, the discrepancy between the wattage that Dan Bingham put out for his hour record compared to that of Wiggins and uh, potentially Eddie Merckx as well, between 60 and 100 watts even. And so with the support that he's had from Team Ineos, to what extent did almost um, the support uh, sort of buy the record, um, if you could put it in that way? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really good question. It's, it's a tough one to answer and you've got to look at it from kind of multiple different viewpoints, I think. From one point of view, his power was definitely down compared to previous attempts. But you've also got to remember that holding between 330 and 350 watts over an hour is still incredibly hard. Maybe what this really shows is that there's still a lot of potential within the hour record to make some significant gains. I think Dan Bingham has shown what happens when you have an expert mind in aerodynamics taking on something of this scale. Pair that with the power of someone who can ride at 400, 450 watts. And I think that's when you'll see an incredible jump forward in what's possible. And I think potentially up till now, 
We just haven't had the perfect recipe or someone really extract as much as they really could do. Yeah, I think um, that's definitely the case. Not to put it down to a damn big and sort of like physical attempt at all. I mean, you, know, you couldn't take um, any person and just put them on a bike. I mean, the position that he was able to hold. And for the hour, like, it's a very, very different uh, beast uh, when actually riding around the velodrome without fixed gear and not taking on any water for a whole hour. So yeah, the physical element to it is uh, still extreme. But at the same time, uh, you do have these almost genetic freaks, don't you? Yes. To pair the uh, the power of um, somebody like Ghana with the uh, with the aerodynamics that um, uh, Dan Bingham has been able to prove. I think that, as you say, uh, that's where we're going to really see uh, the hour record jump forwards, or potentially not, as aerodynamics uh, increases as the square philo uh, velocity. And so somebody who's significantly more powerful isn't going to actually go that much faster. And so it in could only be kind of 10, 20 percent. But I mean, in terms of the actual that, distance, plus. exactly. I mean, but I mean, it would still create a new record, but it may only be by a couple of hundred meters, not another 400. Exactly, and it would take the aerodynamicists amongst us to realize exactly how much of an achievement that really is. So recently, Trek issued a recall on their handlebars, and more specifically, the Bontrager Alus RSL VRC handlebar stem combo. So those are the carbon all-in-one handlebars that you'd often see on the 2022 Speed Concept SLR bikes and the 2021 to 2022 Amonda SLR bikes. Now, what Trek are worried about here is that the handlebar and stem could crack under load, which would obviously mean riders could lose control and crash. Trek have said that customers should immediately stop using their bicycles or bicycles equipped with the ALS RSL VRC handlebar and stems and contact their local Trek retailer. And that's what they said in a statement. Um, what are they going to do to the bikes and how are they going to fix the problem, Stefan? So they're going to be uh, replacing the um, handlebar stem with a, a unit that isn't beset with them these kinds of problems and they're also going to be offering a hundred pounds or a hundred dollars uh, in store credits as well so it's um, yeah quite good um, how uh, Trek's been approaching this problem and I suppose maybe one thing is to say is that um, it's um, because of the risk of this um, uh, handlebar and snapping that they're calling it in it's uh, an extra level of caution that um, they're taking and so if you have been uh, riding on this like you won't necessarily have experienced a problem yourself but it's just an abundance of caution that um, Trek is taking here. Of course and actually this isn't the first time that we've seen a big brand pulling in bikes because of issues with handlebars. I think we've seen it from the likes of Specialized Factor. Yes, with Canyon, they had uh, the problems uh, both with the seat post and also with handlebars that snapped under Matthew van der Poel in that race last year. But also, yeah, there was the issue with uh, Factor and the head tube and the bung and that, um, yeah, um, the expander that wasn't um, working properly. And as you say as well, the issues that Specialized have been having, and it does feel like we've had a little bit of a spate uh, quite recently. Uh, obviously, each of these are going to have uh, their own causes and their own reasons um, why uh, using uh, different factories uh, for the most part. But yeah, you can't help but think that maybe the uh, sort of push towards ever lighter weights and we're seeing the result of this. It's the higher end uh, products that are being beset by these problems, isn't it? It's not the low end ones exactly. quite so much. Uh, so maybe that yeah, could be a little bit of a sign that we are kind of butting up against the limits of what can be achieved with carbon at the moment. Absolutely. And if anything, it does kind of push the argument for a traditional bar and stem, which in many cases can be just as light, but without the issue of them failing. Precisely. Now, earlier this month, we heard the very sad news that Mike Burrows had passed away at the age of 79 after a two year long battle with lung cancer. He came from Norwich and in the 1970s, he was mostly a touring cyclist, but did also compete in time trials. And in a sport that's often slow to adapt, he brought in ideas from his time racing model aeroplanes. Mike dressed himself in tight lycra before it was commonplace and he also knew that his shaggy hair probably wasn't that aero so kept it under a balaclava and he continued racing time trials all the way until 2018. Mike is perhaps best known for designing the Lotus 108, which Chris Boardman memorably rode to gold in the 1992 Barcelona Olympics. The story goes that Mike Burrows showed the design to the bike brand Rally, but they weren't interested. It was perhaps a little bit too innovative for them. Interestingly, Rally went bankrupt just a year later, but Mike Burrows himself went on to join Giant and help with the development of their bikes there. Now, we've probably all heard of a giant a TCR, but it was Mike Burroughs that was uh, the brains behind the decision to lower the top tube, which uh, helps to stiffen the frame and also save a bit of weight. And it's now a design that is almost ubiquitous across all uh, performance bikes. And that um, design was first thought up by Mike Burroughs himself uh, back when he was working with Giant. 
Another innovation that perhaps we're all familiar with, although maybe not the source from which it came, is the cable barrel adjuster. Mike designed this while he was at Giant, and it's certainly sad that uh, he didn't patent it, and now we see it on bikes all across the spectrum. And he, I thought that uh, it could have made his millions um, had he done so. He was a massive fan of recumbrance, and when it comes to human-powered vehicles, why not actually maximise your efficiency? Low to the ground and with the potential to cover it in an aerofoil, you can go much faster than you would be able to on a conventional road bike. Off the back of his calculations, he would happily argue that Bradley Wiggins' fastest time up Mont Ventoux 2 could have been faster still had he been riding one. Although there's a weight penalty, the climb isn't that steep, and actually, the aerodynamics would have been the governing force. But it's not just speed and racing that made Mike tick. After giving up on the car during the 70s oil crisis, he turned his attention to utility bikes. A great example of this is the 8 Freight, which had a 2 meter long wheelbase and could carry loads of up to 100 kilos whilst weighing just 20 kilos itself. It's fair to say that Mike Burrow's contributions to how bikes are designed and thought about will last for generations, and his ability to think outside the box will never cease to inspire. Now, in the world of circular bike bling, Zip has released a brand new wheel set in the form of their brand new 858 NSWs. Stefan, these wheels are pretty light. I mean, insanely light when you think about how deep they are, right? You pick them up and um, yeah, your mind just doesn't compute, <laughs> essentially. You think that they are going to be um, so heavy, but actually, yeah, as you say, um, just over uh, 1,500 grams. It's, yeah, it really is um, quite incredible, the weight of these wheels at the depth that they've achieved. Some wheels that are around about this weight point, and the depth is only about 45 millimeters, whereas here, uh, we've got 82 to 85 millimeters deep. So incredibly deep section, but a really, really impressive weight. And how much are these wheels going to be costing people? Uh, well, exactly. So you've got to pay for um, this kind of um, depth and this weight. And so um, they are extremely expensive, really. So um, in the UK, it's going to be £3,750. And in the US, it's going to be $4,400. And so, yeah, these are... Yeah, premium wheels. Premium wheels. But um, at the same time, they uh, do promise uh, an awful lot. And especially uh, for the, the 858 NSW wheels and um, with those undulations, which are supposed to uh, help the um, crosswind stability, helping to um, yeah, discard some of that um, turbulent air. And so uh, potentially you've got a wheel set here that uh, weighs the same as uh, many uh, 40 millimeter deep wheels, uh, that has the stability of a midsection wheel, but then has the aerodynamic benefits of um, an extremely deep section wheel. And so it's kind of ticking a lot of boxes um, here. And so uh, yeah, I for one am going to be very, very interested to yeah, see how they actually do perform uh, out on the road. And I think that's the key thing, because they are so light, you can only only assume that they want people to start using them in the hills and the mountains more often. Do you think that we can potentially see pros using these on hillier days? Uh, I think that we could. I think that there's a psychological element um, for um, some pros. And you yes. see them uh, using uh, the, uh, lightweight climbing bikes when actually um, an aerodynamic bike would be a more efficient choice. And I can imagine that somebody might choose an even lighter wheel set because uh, if you're going for um, this similar lightness of weight, um, the similar price point um, with a shallow sexual rim, it's going to be uh, lighter still. But I think that um, we might see uh, fairly substantial take up and especially I think for crit racing yes. there the speeds are so high but also the accelerations when you get to the corners you've really got to get the bike and turning yes. over and there the weight at the rim is really very important because and it does act like a flywheel doesn't it exactly. so the ability to load it with energy faster means you can you know, pounce out of those corners. Exactly, but, and so I think that um, it's going to be in these uh, areas that um, we're really going to see the um, wheels being sort of like really uh, used uh, to their maximum. Absolutely. Now, I know the weight is gonna be one part of these wheels and it's a pretty big deal, but surely there's gotta be something else about them that makes them special. So um, Zip, uh, they want to get across uh, this concept that um, aerodynamics doesn't equal speed. Okay, and that might sound a little bit uh, counterintuitive uh, just off the bat, but um, yeah, we've got to remember that there's a lot of different factors that um, yeah, make up how fast um, you're going to be traveling to aerodynamics, and especially it's for greater speeds um, that um, yeah, professional riders and uh, in races uh, you're going to be traveling at. But there's um, other factors too, and um, weight when you're going uphill is one of them. But uh, another major factor is the rolling resistance. And so uh, this is another case where Zip has been really focusing on this area to uh, maximize games. The aerodynamics are really 
feeling uh, slightly improved over the previous iteration, but by uh, broadening the internal rim width and uh, making it uh, sort of better suited for wider tyres and lowering the pressures, uh, Zip has been able to get a greater speed increase out of these wheels. And so uh, they're going to be not significantly faster, but there's a step up in the performance there, but it's not coming uh, significantly from the aerodynamics. It's coming from the rolling resistance. And so you've got a lot of these um, different areas that your gains can be coming from and to focus only on aerodynamics is going to be leaving a lot of stuff still left on the table and Zip is trying to take <laughs> those other elements off the table, um, notably with the rolling resistance. Interesting. Okay, fantastic. Well, it would be good to give those a try actually and um, see how they perform on the road. This month, we are giving away a Garmin Edge Explore 2. Now, this recently released computer is gonna be ideal for those who either ride an e-bike or potentially just don't want all the granular performance data that you often find on GPS computers. A function I particularly like on this computer actually is the ability to link it to your e-bike via the Garmin power mount. Now, when it's linked, this will know how much battery is left in your e-bike and can then route you back home to make sure that you do not run out of charge. And I think that is an incredibly handy feature to have and basically spells an end to range anxiety. So if you'd like to be in with a chance of winning one of these, then head to the link in the description. So this month, the bike of the month, we have a new giant propel, and now it's yeah, quite distinct, quite different to the uh, previous generation. So, oh well, you've um, had it on hand. So yeah, can you tell us um, exactly what's changed? One of the first things that I picked up on actually was the weight of the bike. Now, the one that we had was a medium large, so that sits somewhere between like a 56, 58 kind of size. That one on our scales weighed in at 6.79 kilos, which is incredibly light, not only for a disc brake bike, but just for a modern large road bike. So to see something that light, that was very cool. But they've also just made huge gains in terms of its aero performance as well, or so they claim. They say that it's 6.2 watts faster, whether you'd feel that that is hard to work out. However, I had a very nice set of wheels in, the Kdex Ultra 50s, which were also a new release at the time. But that was the most striking thing, was actually how light it was. How much um, weight has been shaved off the frame there? Yeah, so um, they've actually shaved weight off of kind of several parts of the frame. Um, but over the frame set itself, they managed to save 225 grams, which pretty respectable. They then saved a further 107 grams from their cockpit area. And then those Kdex 50 Ultras are very, very light. Light, um, and they are easily sub 1500 grams. I don't know the exact weight of them, but they had carbon spokes, super light hubs, obviously carbon rims. They were very, very light. Oh, yeah, very impressive, generally, over Kadex wheels. Absolutely. But when it comes to the aerodynamics, like, well, it's notably slimmer, isn't it? Um, the Propel of the previous generations looks so aerodynamic with those thick tubes, but um, yeah, now it's gone on a diet a little bit and yet still uh, claiming to be a little bit faster. Like, what changes have they done to uh, get those gains in the aerodynamics? Yeah, so they've changed a lot of the tube shapes themselves. And actually, the wheels that are in the frame were developed in conjunction with the bike, so they were made to be in it. And that is from an aerodynamic point of view massively um, but you're absolutely right when you look at it it doesn't look as squished it looks a lot more like an all-round bike actually than an out and out aero bike similar to how the tarmac is an all-round bike as well they've introduced a lot of flat surfaces and what they call truncated aero foils so those flat surfaces in theory should help air pass over nice and easily they've also gone to the extent of making specific bottle cages which are made to be mounted one's meant to be on the seat tube and one's meant to be on the down tube and they have been built to take circular bottles. So they've thought through everything and they've also tried to increase the aerodynamic efficiency basically wherever they could. Yeah, that's pretty comprehensive. And wow, well, well um, I think the big three with um, bike launches, it's yeah, the aerodynamics is the weight, but it's also the comfort. Have they done anything there to uh, make so, it a little bit more of compliant? Course, of course they had a comfort claim and what they've done is actually engineered the seat post to, I think it, they've made the carbon a little bit thinner on the seat post um, and made it so that essentially you get a little bit more compliance on it. I mean, you've got two triangles bolted together, triangles being the strongest of all the shapes. It's always gonna be hard to build compliance into that. But they do say, again, you're gonna have to take it from Giant, which obviously they're gonna be biased, but they do say the seat is now more comfortable. It's really interesting because I think with the Giant Propel and obviously this SL7 Specialized Tarmac and actually the Factor Ostro Van, if they were silhouetted, 
They do all look pretty similar and we've got to ask the question, why are bikes looking the same? What's causing it? Well, there's going to be two aspects. Um, one, that there's um, only uh, one shape that is ultimately going to be the fastest. We're in a physical world. There's the laws of physics that apply to us all. Um, there's going to be yeah, just, just one uh, correct answer, really, yes. to what bike is fastest. And then second, there's the UCI, which is um, kind of constraining the bounds within which you can yeah, try and be the fastest within. So I think those two factors um, yeah, are going to lend uh, to a bit of a convergence. And as you say, with the uh, SL7, with the Austria Ram, and with a new Propel, to some extent, these are bikes that are trying to kind of do it all, trying to be lightweight. And well, with the new Propel being able to yeah, getting us that weight is really very impressive yeah. with the aerodynamic qualities that it does have. And so balancing aerodynamics and weight, um, yeah, you're seeing this um, a lot more within a single model. I think for me, actually, I think that um, we're starting to see kind of almost uh, two strands of um, bike design. And so, um, yeah, fully uh, on board with uh, uh, the SL7 uh, having a very similar silhouette to the new Propel. But we've got bikes like uh, the new Scott Foyle, the new Trek Madone. Uh, both these bikes are trying to do the, yeah, the three things, you know, being uh, lighter weight and being uh, more aerodynamic and being more comfortable. But um, yeah, their silhouettes, I think, are, are quite distinct uh, to uh, the propels. The Scott is so deep, and uh, as is uh, the new Chip Madone. question is, which of those is really going to be fastest uh, it, within the actual um, real-world conditions? One might test fast within a wind tunnel, but um, there's yeah, a lot more turbulence, a lot more variables out there. Um, yeah, potentially, uh, the SL7 is faster. But, um, but yeah, the question, I suppose, um, for most of us uh, looking at these bikes is, what kind of bike would we prefer ourselves almost aesthetically but also yeah in terms of uh, yeah what we want to ride so wh where do you stand on <laughs> well it's a, it's a really interesting point that you bring up and actually it's for consumers having a bike that's an all-round bike does make more sense because one day we might want to head out into the hills or you might want to spend a day on the flat so having something like the Propel or the Tarmac makes a lot of sense because it can do it all but for the pros who have the ability to have multiple top-end bikes and choose a bike for their flat day, their hilly day and their mountainous day, that's where the difference lies and it's okay who are the manufacturers making bikes for? Are they making it for the pros or are they making them for us? I mean technically as the customers you'd hope they're making them for us so all-round bikes do make more sense. Aero bikes, on the other hand, would only really make sense for a consumer if you live somewhere completely flat. So maybe our friends over in Belgium. But I think for me, because of where I live here in the UK, an SL7 or a Propel definitely makes more sense. And I think for those who do want that all round bike, for those days you do want to get aero, arguably, you'd be better off just buying a skin suit. You, those those are going to be where you're going to have much more significant gains and you know things like the skin suits from Velotech which cost 100 quid or so have tested incredibly fast that is a much bigger frontal area than what your bike's causing so you know that six watts that the propels managed to save from the previous model supposedly actually a skin suit out on a ride that's going to make an even bigger difference definitely that along with the wheels and also your position being the most important exactly. if you've not um, <laughs> optimized in your position to the absolute fullest extent, uh, what is the point in having an aero bike? You've got other gains um, to get there first. And so it doesn't make sense for most people really to be looking at the frame for the aero games. There's so many other areas uh, to really focus on first. Exactly. I mean, it really is. The bike is just one small part of a very big puzzle. So there we have it. Let us know what you would be riding down in the comments below. Does an aero bike still make sense? Or really, is an all-round bike actually the perfect thing for most riders? If you enjoyed the video, drop it a like, subscribe to the channel for more content, and we'll see you again very soon.